so I wanted you to, to, to see this because, brethren, I, I, I believe this is happening and it is amazing. You see, Yeshua never heard of a theology that the Torah is abolished. He never heard that because he kept referring to it. Now, I want you to see what the enemy did. Remember, you led with ready temptation, right? Remember, the enemy said, Well, it is written. And he wonderfully took him to Psalm 91, which interestingly is a favorite psalm of many of us, and rightly so. But I want you to see the lie and the craftiness of the enemy that stray us away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to the Messiah. Oh, to be like the Messiah. Oh, I love the Psalms. I love to read Psalm, psalm 91, Psalm 23. And oh, the Lord is my shepherd. And I, I, I dwell at Jesus. Refuge and all of those things are wonderful. But we still fall in short of the example of the master. So look at the crafty devil. Read the Psalms. Comforted. Take your refuge in the word. But in a sense, take your refuge in life. Because what he did not do, go with to me to Psalm 91 now. In Psalm 91, you would see something that he didn't do. Beware of people who quote the scripture and only quote half of it. A half truth is a whole lie. A half, a, half, a half of the text is like a whole lie. Because you see, in Hebrew, the word emet has to do with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the middle letter, and the last. Has to be true from beginning, middle, and end. That's MF. It has a, a firm base as opposed to falsehood checker, which is just the end of, of the words when you, when you put together the words of falsehood. It's just the end and it doesn't have a stable base. It falls. You have to know between truth and lie. You have to know if somebody's not quoting the whole text and they're quoting part, it's a, an agenda. And you may be sincere, but sincerely wrong like an O because you're just quoting part of the scripture. But by leaving out, you give me this, but you take it back so much. So look what the enemy did. He gave him, well, it is written, verse 11. For he will give his angels charge concerning you. And look what he didn't do. He didn't stay to guard you in all your ways. He left out that part. So he writes, they will guard you up in your hands. Look at it carefully. The enemy left out to guard you in all your ways. He left that out. So is it wonderful to quote scripture? Yes. But if you're going to quote, quote the whole thing. Because to leave out anything is to run into problems. That's what happened with our mother Eve. You see, he came. And when you look closely, you see, he, he omitted, added, and altered the word. Yeah, had God said. And he added, added things. Don't touch. God didn't talk about no touch. He added and altered and, and, and omit. That's the devil. He's crafty. And if you and I don't know the word, then we wouldn't have an it is written and it is said response. So, let me give you another little insight. In the book of Psalm 91, which is lovely, eh? don't get me wrong, quote Psalm 91, we say that every night. But if you only camping out in Psalm 91 to save you, you, are you understanding how you played right into the enemy? You got to go back because look what our master did. The enemy quoted Psalm 91, he said, on the other hand, it is written. And what did he do? Go back now to Malachi, go to Isaiah. What did he do? He went right back to the Torah. Don't you think that is instructive for us? I believe he's telling us, follow my example. I memorized and pre preoccupied with Davarim, the whole Torah, and I had a summary. So that when the enemy came, I was able to defeat him. You go and do likewise. Hmm. Interestingly, in Psalm 91, there is no Zayin. If you look at this psalm, it, it, you, there are uh, uh, 16 verses, but there's no Hebrew letter Zayin. Look at all of, all of that writing and no Zion is left out. But when you look closer on, no, no, this is, you have to e imagine this. So imagine now the letter Dalit or imagine Aleph or Bet. When you look closer in the Torah scroll, you see a little tittle, a little torn, T-H-O-R-N. You see a tagin. And when you look at it, the tagin, when you extract it, is in the shape of a Zion. So the, the letter Zion is not there, but a small Zion is upon the letters in Hebrew, in Psalm 91. And what the rabbi says is that they use this text when they're doing exorcism, when they're delivering people from demonic holes. They pray this psalm because they believe that when they pray these words, the Zions, as it were, make an impact. The small Zion leave the scriptures and make an impact in the realm of the spirit and defeat the enemy. Is that so? We don't know. But it's instructive that this is the psalm that is used. 
So I'm not saying don't memorize Psalm 91. No Psalm 91, but no. Psalm 91 has a tiny Zion. And I take you back to Malachi chapter 4 that has a large Zion. That little Zion is telling you, remember the large Zion. In other words, you can't understand Psalm 91 if you have not been immersed in the Torah. You can't have Psalm 91 and no Torah. Because David wrote Psalm 91 out of the Torah. Where did you think he learned about refuge and fortress from? Where do you think he learned this thing? But long life will I satisfy and show you my salvation. Where do you think he learned that? Genesis 49, I wait for your Ye Yeshua. He would have known the text. David was a man after God's heart, the Torah. So all of scripture comes out of the Torah. I'm saying that again and again. All right. So we have that in, in mind. And then when you read this week's Torah portion, you get this understanding of all these prophecies that, that Jacob spoke about, all these prophecies. And there's a text. Let me just give, give you this. Thank you, Father. First Timothy 1.18. Go back with this to me that. First Timothy 1.18. I want to give you this. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 tells us this. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Using the prophecies that is made concerning you, you fight the good fight. What, what is the catch you're making? When you go back to the prophecies that Jacob spoke over his children, they were supposed to use that to resist the enemy. When you see the prophecies again that, that, that's written in the book of Deuteronomy concerning children of Israel, they were supposed to use that to overcome the enemy. That's what I'm saying. So you, you meditate, you memorize these things, and you come to understand, oh my God. What is God saying? So you think back again at Ephesians 6, 7. It's a startling thing this for us to consider this. That God would say to us, my word is my sword. Take it, use it, fight with it, pray with it, work with it. God is telling us that. He's not leaving us without weapon. But go with me to Hebrews chapter 4. A text that I believe by God's grace we need to uh, uh, revisit and understand now in a depth of understanding that we may not have had before. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I believe if I ask any person about this, they will tell me this refers to the written word. So we read this. So the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and, and I'm almost certain that you think it means the written word. But read deeper. What, what, watch this. For the word of Elohim is living. That should be a, an indication. It's living and active. It's movement in the realm of the spirit. Sharper than any two-edged sword. So there's a two-edged sword that's sharp, but this one is sharper than that. Piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. And you're still thinking the written word, right? No. Keep going. And there's no creature hidden from his sight. So what am I saying? Don't hold on only to the, to, 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 to the word of God as the written word, but see, the word of God is the living word. It's Yeshua himself. It is the word made flesh. I'm laboring to show us that the written word must become the living word. It's the word that proceeds. It's not, the, not a Bible that you have under your pillow. That does nothing. You have to take the word. You have to take Messiah in you and let him come out of your lips. It, it is because his sight, but all things are open and laid before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Are you seeing it, brethren? Some saints us, when you read the book of Davarim and you see words, you must understand that the words is a person. If you're just learning words, then you will not be as effective as you and I can be unless we see that this word it really becomes the word who is a person. Are you understanding the difference? Because you could go away now memorizing words and feel that is what is overcoming the enemy. No, you need to see the living word because you and I don't overcome the enemy. It is Messiah in us who overcomes the enemy. It is he who resisted and defeated the enemy. Not his knowledge of scripture per se, but the spirit of God in him. And when you and I understand that Messiah in us and we are in Messiah, we don't know see the word, we see the word. That's what I'm laboring for us to see. It's before him. So those words become a word. It is the word of God 
Yeshua is the sword of the Spirit. I'm laboring to show us that Messiah is the living sword, is the living word of God. And unless you begin to conceptualize and see him fighting against the enemy, stand still and see the salvation. Yeshua himself is fighting for us. He is the living word. So I'm laboring to bring it home to us so that you don't go away with the Greek mindset of, of memorizing words. You need to see that the words, oh my God, is the person of Yeshua himself. So, ah, it is Yeshua, not the written word, who is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is Yeshua himself. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. For since he himself was tempted, look at it now, in that he has suffered, he is able to come. Who is coming? The written word? No, it is the living word, the rhema word that is coming to those who are tempted because he knows it is himself who has to resist the enemy. The enemy is not afraid of us. He's afraid of Messiah in us. That's why Messiah must dwell richly in us and we must see ourselves in him and, 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 and he in us so that he becomes the word that defeats the enemy. He becomes Davarim. That becomes the word because when you see you see you you have in Ju, Ju, oh my, thank, thank you father go across with me to deuteronomy chapter eight deuteronomy chapter eight deuteronomy chapter eight thank you rock Akurish. verse one in your bibles you would read all the commandments that i'm concerning you today all the commandments but in hebrew it's all the commandments now, how would you figure that? Doesn't make good English, but all the commandments. Why? Because there's a unity of the spirit. The words become the word. That's what I'm laboring for us to see. You see commandments. I see one commandment because they're all connected. So the break one is to break all. That's what James is telling us. If you, if, if you don't commit murder, but you steal, you're guilty of all because the word of God cannot be broken. It's one. It's a person who's fighting for us, not words on a book. Are not words that we just speak. You got to see the Spirit of God. You're releasing the Messiah. Go back with me, Father. Oh my God. Go back to me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We're back in that again, going to and fro through the book. But Hebrews, we just read uh, uh, chapter 2, but we're going back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. We just read in verse and, and 2 18 about He comes to aid. Those who are tempted, he comes. And look at chapter 2. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, verse 1, consider Yeshua. Consider Yeshua, the person, Yeshua, the apostle. What does the apostle mean? The one who sent forth and high priest of our confession. So what is God saying to us? When you and I take the words upon our lips, you must see it is Yeshua who is being sent forth by our confession that lines up with the word. We are, we are thinking like him, speaking like him, responding on him, and we are seeing Messiah literally coming forth from our mouth to defeat the enemy, to resist the temptation. Consider Yeshua, not consider the written words. If you just stay with the written words, then you have not gone over into every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so as I close, I wanted us to consider. I believe our master gave us some wonderful examples. The word, the university now becomes the word. And I want us again to challenge us to internalize, memorize the book of Deuteronomy. He said, Rob, that's a tall order. Well, we have the rest of our lives to do it. Find a way to do it. Now that you have this insight, now you had wisdom before. Now you have insight. I think following the master in this regard would help us to resist and defeat the enemy. I believe, look at the example of the master. Let me give you a little clue. The enemy came with, to turn these stones into bread. And you'll say, well, I wouldn't be tempted to do that because we can't do that anyway. But when you and I choose a materialistic view, when we choose to remain only in the temporal, when we have yielded to the temptation already. Nope, no enemy comes to tempt you to turn stone into bread because you can't do that. But how are you turning stones into bread? When you decide to look at a long television show and do no top, I have to bring it home to us. You have just yielded the temptation of taking that as temporary to deflect you and distract you from the eternal. You have failed the test. I'm suggesting to us the master so knew the book of Davarim that the enemy said bread and he was able to search through 1 to 34 to see what text has the word bread in it. And he came out with that one. 
I'm submitting to us that in the book of Davarim, there are enough words in there that if you look careful enough, you would see there is a text for every temptation that you and I would face. And it would do us well to memorize that. Because when the tempter comes, and he will come, we must say it is written or it is said. I want you to see again. The enemy tried to move him over into Psalms. But the, our master, whose example we should follow, brought him back to the Torah. There has to be an insight in that. Which means that you and I could swim in the waters of Matthew to Revelation and be defeated by the enemy, all the while being blood washed, but being an unwise virgin, because you don't have the oil of Torah in you. Oh my God, look at the master, look at the master disciples and imitate him. If he went back to Deuteronomy, what you doing going to Psalm? What you doing finding refuge in the Lord is my shepherd? You find that in the Torah. And then you will now be able to use the other things because anything else that doesn't line up with the Torah is not going to work anyway. So I want to submit to us, brethren, to look at it. So as I close, I just want to give us some little snippets as to how this may play out. So the enemy comes and tempts you with partiality. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. Because he, he will come and tempt you with partiality. All right? You'll be partial towards your own family. You'll be partial towards somebody. And the partiality is there, brethren. You ever still heard somebody, you are talking with them, and they're so partial towards their family that they cannot wait for you to finish to start talking about their family. You're being partial and you don't even know it. You can't let another person's family have the limelight and don't say nothing after that. You're tempted. To be partial towards your family. But look what God says. The enemy comes to tempt you. Look at verse, uh, 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 verse uh, chapter 1, verse 17. You shall not show partiality in judgment. It is written, you shall not show partiality in judgment. I'm giving you the sword of the Spirit to resist, to stand, withstand, and remain standing against the enemy. You've got to find within the book a word that could fight. Against, you know, remember our master, it was told our master, he's not partial to any. Where did he learn that? It was written, you shall not show partiality. So he doesn't care. All young, rich, poor, look, look at the verse. You shall hear the small and the great alike. Partiality is of the devil. And you don't have to be able to recognize when we are being tempted to be partial. And be careful of being tempted to be partial towards your realm. I'm not the sage on the stage. We guide and decide. I'm a teacher by God's grace, but there are other teachers also that we can learn from providing that we are all being led of the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? God said, do not show partiality. Whether they, 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 they give the most finances or they give the least finances, don't show partiality. You can't fear them. If I didn't know that, I would be a basket case in ministry, but I'm learning not to show partiality. Where did I learn that? It is written, you shall not show partiality in judgment. And fear, fear comes against us. So let's go to Deuteronomy 3.22. Do not fear them, for the Lord your God is the one fighting for you. So fear comes upon you. Do not fear this person or this situation, for it is Adonai himself in Messiah who is fighting for you. That's the remedy to overcome fear and anxiety and worry. Do not fear. Where did he learn that? How many times the master has been telling us, don't fear, don't keep on fearing. The Lord is fighting for you. He got this. You don't have to be worried about it. But it is written, it is said, do not fear. It proceeds out of the mouth of God. Growing weary and well doing. Go with me to chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. Chapter 4, verse uh, Deuteronomy. We all know in Deuteronomy. Chapter, chapter 4, verse 3. Let your, your eyes have seen what Hashem has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you have held fast to the Lord your God and are light today, every one of you. Hold fast. You want to grow weary and well doing? Consider the case. How, how did God deal with those who didn't hold fast? And therefore it is written, hold fast. I'm, I'm trying to show us how the master may have meditated and memorized the word so that you don't grow weary and well-doing. And then from the scriptures, do you know, oh my God, the master would have told us God is a consuming fire. 
Deuteronomy, consuming fire. He's a jealous God. He's a compassionate God. He's a living God. He's a faithful God. He's a great and mighty and awesome God. He is your praise. He is one. He is God. Go with me to Deut Deuteronomy 4.39. All these things that I just said, I came extracted out of Davarim. God is a consuming fire. God is a jealous God. God is a compassionate God. Where do we learn all these things? In Psalms? No, back in Deuteronomy. All right? God is Eckhart. Look at me at uh, 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 De Deuteronomy 4. 39. Know therefore today and take it to heart that the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You need to have that written response. The Lord, He is God. What did Elisha do? He had to teach the people, the Lord, He is God. And when they got it, what did they say? When they saw the fire come down, what did they say? Adonai, He is God. Adonai, He is God. What happened? The word became alive, proceeded out of the mouth of God and able to defeat the prophets of Baal. Are you seeing it, beloved? I want to submit to us to memorize, internalize the book of Davarim and use it as a sword of the spirit against the enemy. If our master did it and we are not above our master, then you and I should find ourselves learning this text. And then when we seek what to eat or drink, man shall not live by bread alone. If you focus only on what to eat, what to drink, you know that. Seek for the kingdom. Where did we get that? Out of Deuteronomy. Don't operate with slack and bow string. Where did I get that from? Be diligent. I mean, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Be diligent, parents. You can't operate in a slack and bow string because a slack and bow string will result in a slack child. And God is going to hold you accountable because you're operating with a slack bow string. You can't shoot that arrow because you're not yourself being an a, 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 a arrow, a, a, a bow that is tight. Therefore, the arrow just going right there. Because you and I are being operating with slack bow string. Why? Because you have not internalized. You shall teach them diligently. So you want to understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we forget and stumbling over, you're not being diligent. Davarim, the sword of the spirit. What do you deal with? Complacency when the enemy come and tempt you to be complacent? Well, let, let that pass. No, the sword of the spirit. Be diligent. When you rise up and be diligent, then you see the victory. All right? When you think about being stubborn and in idolatry, again, God is telling you about that in Deuteronomy. Don't rely on a miracle. Don't test the Lord your God. Don't lean on your own understanding. God wants to humble you so that the test to know what is in your heart. How to resist false prophets. How to, to, to know what is forbidden to eat and what is permitted. All that out of Deuteronomy. Not to be charitable. When you're tempted not to be charitable, he tells you don't have a hard heart and close your hand. All out of Deuteronomy. All right? Uh, uh, what to, 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 to treat the, the holy days as common. Deuteronomy tells us about the Shabbat and the festivals. If you're treating it as common, then you're operating in, in, in a slack bowstring. The enemy has already deceived you. All right? Don't consult the occult. What you do when you find lost items? How to keep your promise? Live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. How to not speak evil? Go with me to, to, to Deuteronomy 24, verse 9. Deuteronomy 24, verse 9. Deuteronomy 24, verse 9. I tell you this book. Oh, my God. I see this book. No, not, not as a written book. I see it as a living Messiah. Deuteronomy 24, verse 9 tells us this. Remember what Adonai, your God, did to Miriam on the way as she came out of Egypt. When you're tempted to speak Lashon Hara, remember what God did to Miriam. That's your weapon against gossiping and listening to gossiping and murmuring and coming. Remember what God did to Miriam. And when you remember, then you find yourself not yielding to the temptation to gossip and murmur and complain. All right? When, you, when we stray away, Deuteronomy 30 tells us we're going to repent. When we find that for our study is too difficult, go with me to Deut Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. Say, Lord, this Torah thing is too difficult for me. Right? That's the temptation that comes. So I would put that aside because this is too taxing for me. I'm not able with it. I didn't go to school. Not taxing for it. That's why I love those who are engaging themselves in Torah study. You're, you're, you're resisting the flesh and you're going at it. Why? Because for this commandment, which I command you today, is not too difficult. Yes, it has its challenges, but you don't give up and say, well, that's too difficult. No. It's not out of your reach. It's not within your lap. But it's within your reach. You have to exert yourself. And if you're not willing to exert yourself, then you have already been deceived. And then go with me as I close to Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 29. Deuteronomy uh, uh, 
32, did I say, it's 32, what, what I have, 3329, I'm saying, but just, just give me the finest, it's, uh, the text is not right, it, it's 32, so it's 32, the one that I want to give, verse 47, yes, go with me to Deuteronomy 32, verse 47, 32, Deuteronomy 32, verse 47, says this, for this Torah, is not an idle word for you. It is your life. Messiah, to live is Messiah. Messiah is our life. This Torah thing, this Deuteronomy, is not an idle word. This is life and death. This is eternal issue. It is your life. And by this word, you'll prolong your days in the land which you're about to cross over. So if you're slack concerning your Torah study, then it has not become your life. If you don't understand that, 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 that where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Or where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. How you give and what you give is, is a, a, as a revelation of where your heart is. You may think that you're generous, but your heart is there. But if your treasure is not there, let God be true. You've closed your hand. You've made your heart hard. Deceive in yourself. But when you go back to the text, you recognize, oh my God. I have yielded, failed the test. And then let me just close with, with this one. Deuteronomy 33, verse 29. Deuteronomy 33, verse 29. I'll just close with this one. I'm hope I'm just giving you the example. We can't do all because we'll be here for the rest of Olam Haba. All right? But verse 29 says, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Adonai, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies will cringe before you and you will tread upon your, their high places. You think if you memorize that, you could be deceived to thinking that the church replaced Israel? You think if you have memorized that, you could be having a low view of, of the Torah? Look at it. Blessed are you, O Israel, the sword of your majesty. I'm just showing us again, brethren. As I close, bring it to a close. Deuteronomy, the sword of the spirit. See it as the living word. I have asked, I say, Father, so how do I do this now? And for me, and you're not bound by my practice, but I submit to you. In addition to all the other readings that I would have to do, I have to find a way to read a chapter of Deuteronomy a day. That's for me. So I set out by my heart to, okay, there are 34 chapters. So I realized that that's going to work. So I said, okay, chapter one, I'm going to read chapter one and chapter 31 on day one. Chapter two and verse 32, chapter three and, uh, and chapter 33, chapter four and chapter 34. And then I go on the fifth day, chapter five. I'm just, I have to find a way to make this thing real to me. You may need to find your own way, but the bottom line is when you have to resist the enemy, Make sure you have a word from Deuteronomy. And I'm saying, beware of the, the tempter tempting you to go to the Psalms or the Gospels or wherever. You're following the rabbi. You're following his example. You're following Rabbi Yeshua. What did he do? He went right back to Davarim. And I'm saying, if that is the most quoted book from the master, you need to see Davarim coming alive. He is the sword, the, the, that the, the, the two-edged sword that is sharper. The book of Davari. So I make that case in so many different ways, and I hope by God's grace we get it. So, Father, in the merit of King Messiah, we pray that we would take the sword of the Spirit, which we see now in one instance is Deuteronomy, and we pray we'd be able to use the words as the word proceeding out of your mouth to resist and defeat the enemy. Lord, let this not escape our notice. But give us the grace and the strength, the resolve, to lean out to our own understanding, but receive the hukma, bina, and the ad that comes from you. And to be able to stand, withstand, and having done all, remain standing. Taking the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Because there is coming a point in time when we wouldn't need to use your Word as a sword. Your Word would be bread and life. But until then, Father, help us to use the word. Let the spirit bring the words, the things to our remembrance. The book of Davarim that we have memorized so that we would not be deceived by the tempter. To Yeshua the Messiah be glory. Now in this generation, in this congregation, and world without end. Amen. Be amen. <laughs>